بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد كثيرا وطيبا مباركا فيه وصلوات الله وسلامه على رسولنا الكريم الأمين المصطفى الحبيب وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين As it was mentioned today's lecture is dealing with a contemporary issue an issue that actually can have some conflict in the mind of a person and that is why do we find that the Ummah of Islam is suffering from lowliness right now the reason why I say that there can be some conflict in comprehending accepting and embracing this issue is the fact that there are many many ayat of the Quran that clearly indicate that Al-Islam is the deen of Allah and the Muslims are the ummah and the nation that Allah has divinely chosen and he gave them a rif'ah and raised them over everybody else. Many ayat tell us that. Allah is the one who sent his messenger with the religion of truth so that he would proclaim the religion of Muhammad وسلم, over all other religions. And yet, the deen of the Yahud and the deen of the Nasara, but especially the Yahud, who are less in number, their soul and their jola and their quwa, their power, is greater than what we see in the earth today, in the dunya today, as it relates to what's happening. So how do we deal with that appearance a, a, a parent conflict, meaning ayat. What I tell him, what I tell him, and what I tell him, and what I tell him, and what I tell him, do not be sad, don't be faint hearted, don't be weak in your mind, because in reality, you people are upper and superior if you only believe. So, how do we take all of these ayat and the hadith of the Nabi? Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and understand them. Those ayat in Surah Al Munafiqeen, when the Prophet was traveling, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the troublemaker from the Munafiqeen, along with his cronies, they mentioned as the Quran said, Wala in Rajana in al Madinati, Yukhrijan al Azumin al Adal. When we go back to Medina after this trip, when we get back, the honorable ones from amongst us, meaning the hypocrites, we're going to kick out and we're going to expel the lower ones from amongst us. And the lower ones in their mind was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ashab, Ridwan Allahi alayhim. So they said, we're going to kick them out. After we return from this trip, we're going to expel them from Al Medina. And they said that we were the ones who have Izzah, the Munafiqeen, and the Prophet and his companions, sallallahu wa sallam, alayhi wa radiyallahu anhum, they were the ones who were low. Allah Ta'ala told the Prophet when that statement was brought to his attention, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to tell those people, inna al-izzati lillahi wa lil-rasulihi wa lil-mu'mineen wa lakin al-munafiqeen la ya'lamu. Tell these people who made this statement, Izzah, ana. Is for Allah and Izza Ana is for the Messenger of Allah, no doubt about that. And Izza and Ana is for the believers during the time of the companions, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, no doubt about it. And Izza was for the Mu'mineen. But right now, right now, is the Izza for the believers? The Muslims who are representing Al Islam today here in the UK. And in other countries, especially those countries that are under the foot and around their neck is the yoke of oppression and tyranny from the non-Muslims. Is that Izzah when a giraffe is being transported from one place to another place in a big lorry and the giraffe hits its head on the bridge and it gets killed. The whole world jumps up and down about how the giraffe had rights, animal rights. He should have been tied down. He should have been transported in another way. An American dentist or doctor goes to Africa and he hunts a lion and he shoots the lion. 
When they hear about him shooting the lion, he had to fly back to America and go into hiding because the whole world started talking about the poor lion that was shot by the American doctor, and he was defenseless. When something happens in Europe or anywhere, something happens to a non-Muslim, the whole dunya jumps up and down about what happened. Maybe the Muslim committed a crime, maybe he didn't commit the crime, but the whole dunya jumps up and down. A bomb falls in Syria. Whether the Russians dropped a bomb or other than the Russians. Bomb falls in Syria and there are children and women and people were buried alive. And their bodies are strewn all over the place. And we barely hear what's going on. Muslim Ummah doesn't even know. For the last four weeks now, in Kashmir, occupied Kashmir, there's another tragedy on the level of Palestine, except that Palestine is the third holiest place in Al Islam. But for the last four weeks, the Hindu government in India have been perpetrating all kinds of atrocities on the defenseless Kashmiri Muslim community. And the world doesn't know about that. We didn't hear about that. So does this ayat apply to the reality of the Muslims today, that the Izza is with the believers? So as I said, there are many ayat like this, that it can be a conflict. If a person is not thabit or stable in his religion, he can begin to have doubt about what Allah mentioned in the Quran. Because he says, look, I'm seeing this with my own eyes. But the person who has Iman and he has a minhaj and he reads about his religion, he sees that there's no conflict. There's an explanation. There are things that if this ummah were to engage in those things, then they're going to compromise that pedestal and that platform of an izza that Allah promised. And as Allah mentioned in many ayat of Quran, in Nuhu la yukhliful mi'ad, Allah doesn't break his promise. He promised the Prophet Sallallahu He promised his companions, you people are going to dominate this peninsula and your religion is going to dominate the world as well. They had no doubt about that, but they stuck to their contract. And one of the things we're going to mention is directly connected to that. You break your contract with Allah as well, as a result of that, a direct result, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices to pay is lowliness if you break the contract. The other thing, Ikhwani, that should be considered here is the history of Beni Israel. The history of Beni Israel is crucial and is extremely important for the Muslim to know about the history of Beni Israel from the prism of the Quran and the Sunnah. What the Quran has told us about what happened chronologically in the order of what happened with Beni Israel, his prophets and his messengers with his people, and what the Sunnah says, that's part of our responsibility to know. And one of the main reasons for that is the famous hadith, لَتَتَّبِعُنَّ سُنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلُكُمْ شِبْرٌ بِشِبْرٌ وَذَرَاءٌ بِذَرَاءٌ You people are going to follow the people who went before you, hand span by hand span, and arm span by an arm span. One hadith said if they go into the lizard's hole, you're going to go into the lizard's hole. Something lowly. Who wants to go into a lizard's hole? And that's from the Jawam al kalim and from the Fasaha of the Prophet ﷺ, from his eloquence. Because when he told his companions, to the point you will follow those people to the point if they go into the lizard's hole, the companions know about the lizards. We don't know about no lizards. We don't know anything about no lizards other than I don't want to deal with no lizards. I, they want the creepy creatures. I don't want to deal with no lizard. But the companions know that the hole of the lizard is not just a regular hole that the lizard just goes in and it's just a straight hole and he goes in and he slides down. The hole of the lizard, it has pockets that the lizards build in the hole. That once they get in that hole, they're going to hold on to those pockets. And if you catch them before he gets all the way into the hole and you try to pull him out, you're going to rip his tail off before you pull him out. He's going to grab with four arms, four hands, every pocket to show what the hadith shows, the tenacity and the degree of how much you're going to follow Ben Israel in everything that they did. Another narration of that particular hadith said, you're going to follow them to the point if one of them were to have relationships with his own mother in public in front of the people, there's people from your community who's going to do that. 
So this thing about Beni Israel, Allah Ta'ala favored Beni Israel over everybody else. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ فَضَّلَكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Remember Beni Israel, the favors of Allah upon you when he chose you over all of the other people. Beni Israel were the best people. And we have to believe that in Al-Islam. Your group, your ethnicity, your background, Beni Israel of the past better than Africans. Beni Israel in the past they're better than Pakistanis and Asians, better than Chinese people. The only people that were better than this, my, uh, better than Israel, Ben Israel, as it relates to lineage, were the Arabs, because Allah Taala chose Ismail from the children of Ibrahim. So the Prophet Wasallam's lineage, especially Quraysh, are above everybody else. So the point here is. They had more prophets. They had more messengers who were sent to them. So Allah He protected them and He gave them dominance in the earth, subdued their enemies for them. But when they started to do some of the things that happened, they lost that place. So we followed them in many of those things. So we'll take these few minutes, inshallah, to share with you a few of them. And again, the goal and the objective of this information is not to do what they fell into and not to do what will bring upon us lowliness. And if we are engaged or we have something to do with these things in any shape, form, or fashion to discontinue. And there are many. First thing we want to mention is the famous statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ridwanullahi alayhi, when... He was the Khalifa of the Muslims. And the famous incident with Abu Ubaidah, Ibn al-Jarrah, one of the ten people promised Jannah. When he came to Umar and he wanted Umar to ride his horse in a particular way and to enter upon the non-Muslims in a way where they would get a visual that Umar is strong and Umar is the leader because the way he was coming to them was like Umar was just a regular person. Just a miskeen person, just a regular person. He's the leader of the Muslims, but he's just a normal person. He doesn't have a helmet on his head. He doesn't have a long sword. He's not riding his horse in any particular way. But instead, he's walking, and he's barefooted. And he's got regular clothes on. So Abu Ubaidah wanted him, no, 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 Amir al-Mu'mineen, change your attire and your demeanor so that when you come in and these people see you, they got to know you're the Umar that they heard about. You're the leader of the Muslims. And the Izza is with Islam, with you and with us, the believers. Umar said to Abu Ubaidah, Ya Abu Ubaidah, I wish someone else other than you would have just said that to me. You're telling me if I get a particular kind of car and I drive that particular car, if I live in a particular neighborhood, if I wear particular clothing, if I talk a particular way, as a result of that, the non-Muslims are going to be impressed with me and they're going to accept me. Um, I said, I wish somebody other than you had made this suggestion. He said, do you remember when we were a group of people, a community, we were down in the dust and we were low and we were downtrodden in the dust. And then Allah brought us Al-Islam. And then Allah honored us with Al-Islam and it raised us up, the Arabs. He said, any time... We look for al-izza in other than al-Islam, then Allah is going to bring us down as a result of that. That's crucial, ikhwani. That's, that's extremely important for every Muslim to hold on to that and to comprehend that. Don't get me wrong and don't get it twisted. In this society, we have to deal in the society in a way that is appropriate. And al-Islam is not against that for you to dress appropriately for different occasions. No problem with that. We wouldn't suggest that if someone is going to go down to talk to politicians on behalf of the Muslims, that he go in the way that he's not really representing. We don't suggest that. We say, no, you have to represent. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was approached by Jibril, and Jibril had a thobe, clothes that were exceedingly white, and his hair was exceedingly black, and he looked nice. 
And when he got up and he left, he said, that's Jibril. He came to teach you a religion. And part of the religion is representing yourself and who you are so that when people see you, they get a good picture of you. So don't get it twisted. Because I know when it comes to our dunya, you understand what I'm saying. But when it comes to the deen, somehow we get, we get selective amnesia and we forget intentionally to be strange. If the guy wants to get married, he wants to get married, he's going to go and meet the family and he's going to wear nice clothes. Because that's the dunya. But when it comes to the religion, he goes somewhere and he looks like a bum and he doesn't represent. He says that the Prophet Sallallahu said that al-badhaza is from al-iman. It's from an iman not to comb your hair sometimes and not to put oil in your hair, to groom yourself. It's not to groom yourself, it's from an iman Don't go overboard and groom yourself. Why do you want to practice that hadith and that sunnah at the wrong time in the wrong context? So anyway, the shahid from the kalam kulli, he is that kalam of Umar that was collected by an imam, uh, al imam Abu Abdullah and Nisaburi in his book in Mustadrak and it's authentic. Number one, if we Muslims look for honor in other than Al-Islam, Allah is going to put you down. So for those of us who are into this honor about our culture, our culture is okay, no problem. But honor doesn't come to us because I'm from Afghanistan, because I'm from Somalia, because I'm from Gambia, because I'm from Mecca. Because Honor doesn't come like that. Honor comes from Practicing the religion. Al-Islam is what makes people have izza. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying in the beginning of Islam, as we mentioned about two weeks ago concerning Umar, he said, oh Allah, help Islam. Give Islam an izza. Islam is already aziz. But he said, give Islam an izza by guiding Umar ibn al-Khattab or Abu Jahl. Because the two personalities, when they come to the religion, they're going to enhance the condition of the Muslims. They're going to help. They're going to help. But the deen itself, halal wa haram, and the deen itself, the deen is from Allah, Azawajal. it's the community that's going to benefit from the resources of this individual, from his personality, and so forth and so on. So that's the first one. Never think that being in the political system or parties of these non-Muslims, being their friends, acting like them, living where they live, dressing like them, naming yourselves like them, living like them, being like them, that's Izza. That's Izza. And those Muslims who talk to us and they talk down at us because we don't want to be like that, we're totally content. We're, we're content with the beauty of Islam and the boundaries of Islam. We don't have to be white people, Europeans, other than that. We don't have to be kufa. There are things that they have that we, with, without any apologies, we take that from their lives, from their society. As for replacing Islam with that, I saw with my own eyes, without mentioning any, any names, but she's an African lady from East Africa. She's a murtadda, kafira billah. And I'm very careful about being emotional and saying that some of these people are kufa. The Quilliam Foundation... Their main speaker who always comes as the representative and the expert in El Islam. He's always talking down on us in Islam, always. Recently, he took a picture of him spread all over the world in his Twitter with the lady Madeleine L. Albright. She was the home secretary or something like that during Bush's time when they toppled the Iraqi government. Over one million kids died in Iraq doing her leadership and this guy was with her taking a picture saying it was the greatest day of his life and these are the people who are the leaders of the world and this and that and this and that but I don't make takfir of that guy although he says a lot of statements of kufr because it ain't my job but this lady I make takfir of her and I make takfir of this lady from East Africa because she herself has apostated her own people free themselves from but anyway and talking about the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order to put him down, she said he was like Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. When he was in Mecca, he was okay. But when he left Mecca, he became a monster. This is what the lady was saying. Why does she talk like that? Why do we get people who talk like that from our community? To put Islam down, to put the Muslims down, they have inferiority complexes to put other people up. I say be balanced, be balanced. 
There are things in Europe, things that were given to us by non-Muslims that enhance the life, even help us to practice our religion. We're going to take those things in with good cheer. They're from the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Beni Adam benefits each other. People living in the desert benefit people who live in the cities. People in the city benefit those who live in the desert. Those people who live in the ocean, on the sea, and around water, they help the people who live on the land, and vice versa. This is the way it is. We're not going to apologize to that. But as for replacing this with that and putting our religion down, our culture, and our civilization down, kella wallahi. Number two, from what has afflicted this ummah, and this is one of the biggest problems we have, is number one. The system of governance in the dunya today with the Muslims. And I'm not talking about any specific rule of the Muslims. But the way Al-Islam and the Muslim countries are, all of the banks, everything, is the system of the non-Muslim, the way of governance, the way of the non-Muslims, their system. So if you look for Izzah in other than this religion, then the price to pay is you're going to be low. And that's one of the reasons we're in this condition. Number two, from what we have, is being in opposition to the Messenger وسلم, and committing shirk. If your ummah, if your community, Bani Israel, if you oppose Musa and his brother Harun, and you oppose Bin, you oppose Yusha, who came after those two, and the rest of the prophets and the messengers, as their stories are very clear in the Quran. They had a consistent pattern of giving their prophets and the messengers a hard time. Prophet and the messengers said, do this, and they did something else. They gave him a hard time. Now we, right now, we don't give Prophet Muhammad a hard time as such, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we give his sunnah a hard time. We give his sunnah a hard time. We give his sunnah a hard time in many ways. And the companions used to consider even if he wasn't there, if you act and behave a particular way, although he's not there, you're still disrespecting him and he's not alive. Like the two men who came to al Medina and they raised their voices and they were arguing with each other and talking loud in his masjid and Umar heard him and he came and he looked out and he said, where are you two from? They said, we come from Ta'if. We're from the south. We're like visitors. We're not from al Medina, So we're not as knowledgeable as the rest of the companions. Umar radiallahu anhu said, didn't you hear the statement of Allah, Ya ayyul ladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt al-nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil qawli ka jahri ba'dikum ba'da Oh you believe, don't raise your voices over the voice of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and don't call out to him the way you call out to one another. Did you hear the ayat? They say, yeah, we heard that. They say, he said, then why are you raising your voices at the grave in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Obviously, they didn't look at it like that. They were like, Rasulullah is in his grave, so he's in his grave. And they got into that. Umar said, had it not been the fact that you people are not from Al Medina, I'd have, I, would, I would have chastised you. I would have dealt with you. So Umar considered that type of behavior of people arguing in the presence of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or close to his grave in his masjid, he thought that was disrespect. Disrespecting the body of Rasulullah, his person, directly, and he's not here. Now, we oppose the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that. Someone would take that very hadith, that incident that I just shared with you, and instead of using it the right way and what it's for, the way we just used it, they'll use it and flip it the other way. And they say, you see, this is a proof that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is alive and he's with us. It's a proof that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way Umar responded to that situation, Umar is having respect for the Nabi, so he is alive. Now, he's alive in the barzakh, in his grave, praying in a way that Allah knows reality. And if you said today, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, that salam was taken to him, and he got it in a way we don't know it's reality, but alive, alive to make dua to him? No, kella. So anyway, khwani, opposing the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his sunnah, something comes to us, and we say, I'm not doing that. It's not from my madhab, it's not from my culture. The sunan, we're responsible, as we mentioned today. Everybody here is responsible for practicing Islam. Everybody here is a guard, a haris, to be responsible to protect Islam according to your ability. You're a haris that has to have hirs. Everybody here. 
But one who says, it ain't my business. I don't give dawah. I'm not the khatib. That's not my job. Leave it to the guy over there. Leave it to somebody else's business. No, it's everybody's business. Collectively. Individual. On different levels. So when the sunnah dies and it fades away and it's done because me, with my own children, I'm neglecting their tarbiyah. I'm neglecting educating them. I'm neglecting. I pray just now in the, in the salah, before me, before me, in the line. I was in this line right here. Before me, in that line right there, was a brother. Another brother was, you know, I mean, it was three brothers on the end. And there was big space between them. So someone tried to get in the space and they gave him a hard time. It's my job, it's your job. After that salat, talk to those people. This is our responsibility not to allow the sunnah to go forth. Not to allow it to dissipate. Anyway, Bani Israel, they oppose their prophets and their messengers in many, many ayahs. And Allah made the nas of this issue. وَدُّرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الظُّلَّةُ They have been given lowliness, abasement has been put down upon them. Those people from Bani Israel, they were put down and they were debased. And they were caused to cling to what was low. And had it not been for a contract that had went forth from Allah with them and from the people with them, after that contract, Allah Ta'ala made them deserving of his wrath and humiliation. And this was their situation. Why? That's because they used to disbelieve in the ayat of Allah and they used to kill the anbiya. And that's because they used to make an itidat. They used to go over the bounds and they used to go out of what was acceptable. So this ayat amongst many other, other ayats, like the issue of taking the cow, the calf for worship. You are an ummah of a tawheed, ummah of tawheed, and then you fall into a shirk, the ummah of monotheism. But our religion, which is against the shirk, we find people, they start to uh, have shirk as the religion. Shirk is tawheed with them. There's a price to pay. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about Bani Israel. Those people who took the calf as worship, they're going to be afflicted with lowliness from their Lord and debasement in the dunya, in the dunya right now, before the hereafter. And we look at our community right now, and all of us, without any exception, Wallahu alam, we know people who their Islam, part of it is shirkun billah, making dua to other than Allah, and all of the things that people do in the countries where we came from. Someone said recently that Kitab al Tawheed is a book that is obsolete, it's a book that we don't need right now. Being a person who doesn't want to be hasty and judging, what do people mean? You have to ask, what are you talking about? Kitab al-Tawheed is obsolete. Because right now, amongst our kids and people here where we grow up, we don't slaughter for other than Allah. Most of us don't swear by other than Allah. That's a fact. We don't do that. But as it relates to making dua to other than Allah, we have people who are connected to us who do that. As it relates to people who put on the ta'weev and the tama'in, that's something that's common. Some of us have kids who have stuff on them to protect them. So to say kitab al-tawheed is obsolete is insanity. There are aspects of kitab al-tawheed that don't apply to us. But if you go to the Muslim world, you go to Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, you go to Pakistan, go to India. You go to the Muslim world, kitab al-tawheed from the beginning to the end addresses everything in the Muslim world. Where the Arabs are right now. Right now, in Arabia, Mecca and Medina, Kitab al-Tawheed from the beginning to the end. Amongst us, Kitab al-Tawheed is obsolete. I say, no, you went overboard. That's too much. But now, nah, there are some abwab chapters of Kitab al-Tawheed that are not our issue. 
I didn't meet anybody born and raised here. I didn't mean he, he's swearing by other than Allah. I didn't, I didn't meet that. I see other things like that. So the point here is, Khwani, our ummah right now is an ummah that is in dire need of a tawheed and learning a tawheed. I'm not making takfir of our ummah, but it's a reality. It's a reality. And then when we live in these societies that we are living in right now, it's easy for your aqid to get mixed up with a lot of the superstition and the kufr that these people have, like the issue of Friday the 13th, like those kinds of issues that people, Halloween, the shirkiyat, uh, Harry Potter, those types of things. The kids are being exposed to magic, and it's just normal to watch it. Although the lady is a witch, this was a jinn, this one is that, and because it's just let it go like that, and those things chisel at a person's aqid. It's going to affect them if there's no inkar. So the second issue is opposing Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his sunnah, his religion, and opposing the issue of a tawheed, the monotheism of Allah. If a group of so-called Muslims fall into that, Allah would debase them by other people who their religion is shirk as a punishment to them. It's not that, okay, the person comes and says, but they also making shit. So why are they over us? Because this is the punishment. You're supposed to know better. These people, they don't know. You're supposed to know better. Number three, ikhwani, and there are many, is the issue of an ikhtilaf between ourselves. Hey, in our ummah, we can't be responsible for entertaining a tafarruq and al ikhtilaf. Some people, this is their religion here in Birmingham and other than Birmingham. The way that people want is for there to always be ikhtilaf for one reason or another. In your own families, you can't allow ikhtilaf to exist to the best of your ability. You got to do something about. We all have to do something about. Getting rid of ikhtilaf and misunderstandings that exist between our family members. Because when there's ikhtilaf, there's a price to pay. On a family level, on a community level, and on a ummah level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many ayat of the Quran, and the number of incidents that transpired with the Nabi showed us that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And sometimes the ikhtilaf doesn't even have to originate from something negative. It can just originate from something that's natural, normal. Like in the battle of Uhud, when the archers came off of the mountain. They took a position other than the position of those who were with the Prophet wasallam, And they disobeyed him, not in trying to be disobedient, but they went against what he said. And they came off of the mountain. As a result of coming off the mountain, they were winning the war prior to that. They were having the upper hand. They were about to subdue their enemy. But when they had ikhtilaf between themselves, there was a problem. They're on the mountain. They said, okay, the war is done. The Muslims are winning. Let's go and get the war booty, the horses and things like that. Some of them said, no. Prophet Muhammad said, don't leave. We have to stay here. They said, no. He was telling us that when the war was about to start. But now, look, clearly we're winning. So we got to go. They said, no, we're not going to go. So some stayed and some left. Ikhtilaf. When they went down, the tables turned. And as a result of that, a number of Muslims from the great Muslims in Al-Islam, the companions, Ridwanullah, they were murdered right there at Uhud when again, after fighting the battle of Badr, and the Muslims miraculously won. It was an amazing feat to beat the Kufa of Quraysh in the battle of Badr. Now this is the second battle and they were beating him again. They were beating him, seriously. But then when they disobeyed that ikhtilaf, then this happened. So Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, Ya ayyul ladheena amanu, oh he mentioned, Wa ati'u Allah wa rasooluh, wa ati'u Allah wa rasooluh, wa la tanaza'u. Obey Allah and obey his messenger, and do not... Argue between yourselves. فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَثْحَبَ رِيْحُكُمْ Don't disobey Allah, obey His messenger, and don't fight amongst yourselves. Don't clash amongst yourselves, because if you do that, your power is going to flee from you. 
your ability is going to flee. Maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the dawa to Allah in this country, in almost every city, especially the big cities, the dawa was spreading all over the place. And people, whether they liked it or they didn't like it, they were being exposed to the teachings of the kitab and the sunnah, and they were being exposed to the ulama who were also calling to that, whether they liked it or not, whether they wanted it or not. And there was no internet. There was no internet. People were being exposed because the brothers, the sisters who embraced that dawah, who got on that dawah, and Allah gave them life and made them brothers, they took that dawah to the best of their abilities everywhere. And then Allah made it so that fitting started to happen between the people of the sunnah. Where they take from the same scholars, they take from the same books, they believe in basically the same thing. For the most part, they believe in the same thing. But they're personal issues. Now that the people are fighting, now that the people are fighting amongst themselves... The people were not on the kitab, not on the sunnah. They're filling the vacuum that's been created as a result of the infighting of the people of kitab and sunnah. And now they are being people who are getting their people to come to trying to accept their way of understanding the religion. And even in some instances trying to put um, the idea in the minds of people that they have to use the Quran and the sunnah as delil. But they change the meanings. But the point here is when people are having ikhtilaf and they're fighting between themselves, it stops the growth and the development of the community. It's one of the worst things that can happen between the people. Don't get me wrong and don't misunderstand. If some group or some people from amongst us need to be spoken to, need to be dealt with, then it has to be done in a way where you address the issue, but the haq is not compromised. But the way it is right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevented and prohibited this ummah from having ikhtilaf on a larger scale. Why is it that the Muslim world can't come together and just say, we are going to boycott the Yahud in the United Nations or with this or with that. We're not going to do business with them in our country. Why, why the Muslims can't do that? And I'm not just talking about the Gulf Arabs, I'm talking about the whole Muslim world. Why, why, why couldn't they come together to solve the problem? Everybody sits and we ask that question and it's easy to answer. And we say, because they don't want the hop. They got some mutual benefit. So they don't, they, they don't come together. What about you? What about me? Why can't we make peace on the level that we are engaging in ikhtilaf with our relatives, with other Muslims who are giving da'wah and so forth and so on. So this ikhtilaf and this tafarruq the end result is mashakin and problems, lowliness. Another issue, Ikhwani, and this is from the worst issues, is loving the dunya and going too much into the dunya. When the dunya becomes the main focus and the main goal of an individual, he's in trouble. And that's what the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone who the dunya is his main goal and his main focus, Allah is going to put poverty right between his eyes. And nothing is going to come to him from the dunya except what was written on him. And anyone who the hereafter is his main goal, objective, and his main focus, Allah is going to enrich him. And the dunya is going to come to him despite itself. Even if it didn't want to come, Allah is going to make the dunya come to him. Does the dunya mean he's going to be a billionaire? Doesn't necessarily mean that. But he'll live. And he'll live with izzah. As for the guy who... He compromises for the dunya. This individual is going to not find happiness. He's not going to find happiness no matter how much wealth he accumulates. But anyway, there are a few hadith concerning this. And ayat as well. Like the hadith that the Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, يُوشِكُوا أَن تَتَدَاعَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْأُمَمْ كَمَا تَدَاعَ الْأَكَلَةُ إِلَى قِصْعَتِهَا The time is quickly approaching, he said to his companions, that all of the nations are going to come towards you and they're going to come after this ummah collectively all of them are going to come after you the same way that the diners come to eat from 
the same plate. The companion said, Ya Rasulullah, is it because we'll be few in number on that day? They're going to get us. They're all going to come after us because we're only a few people. He said, no, you're going to be a lot of people during that time. A lot of people, over a billion peoples. You're going to be a lot of people, but you're going to be like the foam of the ocean. You're going to be insignificant. You're going to be lowly and debased. You know that white stuff on the ocean. The water comes and goes with the tide. He said, you're going to be like that. The Gutha. He said, and Allah is with jealous going to take out of the hearts of your enemy the fear of you and he's going to throw into your hearts al wahim They said, what is wahim He said, loving the dunya and hating the death. And that's how the companions were. They used to go and they would carry the letter of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the leader of Rome, to the leader of Persia and they came out of the desert. The man came from Medina out of the desert. And when he goes to Rome and he looks how Rome is and he goes to Persia and he looks how Persia is, he wasn't blown away. I mean, I can imagine him being amazed at the level of their civilization compared to what was in Mecca and Medina. But he wasn't blown away to the degree where he want to give up his religion, be like them. He would give the letter to the leader. The leader would read the letter and disrespect that companion. And that companion has to act a certain way. He's a Rasul of the Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has to act a certain way. He can't be disrespectful, can't say anything. When that leader would disrespect him, that man, he just keep his cool. And he said, no problem, as you like. But I'm going to come back here with a group of people. And they're going to meet you, meaning the companions. And they love death more than you people love this dunya of yours. You're not going to be able to deal with them. And that izza that those people used to see, it used to cause them to have respect for the Prophet and his companions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. The other hadith the Nabi mentioned about riba. إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَخَفْتُمْ أَذْنَابِ الْبَقْرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرَعِ وَتَرَقْتُمَ الْجِهَادِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ صَلَّتَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ظُلًّا لَا يَنْزِعُهُ حَتَّى تَرْجِعُ إِلَى الدِّينِكُمْ if you people start to engage in riba, if you do usury, it becomes a part of who you are. Whether you're in a Muslim world or non-Muslim world, riba becomes a part of who you are. One of the seven major sins, one of the seven major crimes. It is an issue just about money and, 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 and just benefiting, dunya. If you people were to take the riba and you were to take hold of the tails of the cattle, the chattel, meaning you're tilling your lands. And if you were to become engaged and preoccupied with your azara, agriculture, and you were to abandon al-jihad in the course of Allah, Allah is going to make you low. And he's going to not take it off of you until you come back to your religion. So these issues, they go to show when people become preoccupied with the dunya by taking riba, by becoming preoccupied in agriculture, or however they're going to get money, computers, whatever it is. And the other thing, you abandon jihad. I'm going to tell you guys something. It's from the sunnah of Allah. It's from the fitra. If someone knows that you're not going to offer any resistance, he's going to oppress you. Some people grew up and they went to school. And some of our kids right now, teenagers, they're being bullied. They go to school and they're being bullied. None of you kids, you brothers, you sisters should tolerate being bullied. You have to tell someone about that issue so that something can be done about it. And don't feel that the problem is going to exasperate and become even more if you tell someone and they get involved. You have a religious obligation to have, to have the iman and the strength to say, I'm going to stop this thing from happening to me or to someone else. But the point is, if you don't offer any resistance towards the bully, he's going to keep bullying you. But the day you slap him in the face or you punch him in his nose and you knock his eye in his foot and his left shoe, when you do something like that, then he's going to back up and that's when he's going to respect that if you come and you step over this line you deal with me like that, there's a price to pay. So quite naturally, he's going to have precautions. As for the bully who's not afraid of anything happening to him. You know, these governments, he's not afraid of anything happening. 
the way Benny Adam is. As a matter of fact, some people like that stuff, like the police in America. You people are now just being exposed to this drama. But if it wasn't for Allah, and now on smartphones, we wouldn't have known about this stuff has been going on for a long time. The police in America, unlike the police here for the most part, they have a problem. And their problem is, when you work in that profession, in that capacity, you become like a tyrant, a tyrant. So when you meet people who are doing things, instead of managing the problem, those people come and they hit you and they ask questions later. They shoot you and they ask questions later. And although it may be on the video and they caught them shooting you, the system, the penal system, the system itself is going to support them. So for you young brothers and sisters, yesterday they had a march. They called it Black Lives Matter, those people in America. Yeah, black lives do matter. All lives matter. When we get behind these types of initiatives and these types of programs, you have to get behind these programs with your dean leading the way. Not emotionally, no matter how emotional the issue may be. I know some Muslims back in America, they call themselves Afrocentric. Because black people, Africans, we have been put down. I saw a program the other day on Al Jazeera about the black people in Tunis. The guy had some glasses made. He was black. He had some glasses made with a camera. And he was just walking. The Arab Tunisians were putting him down, saying terrible things, and they're Muslims. And there's that racism wherever you go. Africans have racism between themselves. Racism is just a problem everybody has. But the point is, Africans, black people in the world, we're down more than anybody else. Racism. So now, I don't like that. I hate it with a passion. So I'm going to teach my children and teach the people I deal with. I'm proud where I come from. You know, when I became a Muslim in 86, I met some African Americans when they used to talk. They used to talk with broken English. Like foreigners, Pakistanis and Arabs. Yeah, brother, brother, we're going to brother. And one of them had the bobblehead even, because they was from Jamaat Tabligh. So they were affected by the Pakistani way. So he used to talk with the bobblehead, you know, that thing like that. And I said, man, I ain't got to be no Arab. I ain't got to be a Pakistani. I don't have to give up my culture when I become a Muslim. I can still speak English, regular English, without an accent. So the point is, as a Muslim, I want to support Black Lives Matter or any of these issues. I can't be Afrocentric to the degree and I start praising Pharaoh and the pyramids in Egypt. The, 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 the Egyptians, they had all of the knowledge, they this, they that. What are you talking about? Pharaoh was a mujrim. Pharaoh was a criminal. So you have to have your religion always in front of you, helping you to decide, how do I look at this? How do I look at that? Black lives matter. All lives matter in Al-Islam. From the Dururiyat al-Khamsa is Hivd, Hivd, Hivd dima saving the blood of everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. So the shahid of the kalam, Khwani, is that those two hadith, they go to show if you go too far into the dunya, it's a price to pay. And just so I can make it clear, because I don't want anybody misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm not telling anybody who's getting bullied to punch someone in the face or to slap them in the face. I'm just saying to defend yourself, because generally speaking, bullies, bullies, whether they're presidents, prime ministers, politicians, police, they won't respect you if they know they can do things to you and nothing's going to happen. Police are bullies in America. They're tyrannical because they know if you start to get ready to fight, they're going to shoot you and they have uh, the law on their side. They have the law on their side. Last thing that we want to mention, there are other things, Juani, there are other things, actually two last things. One is the issue of not giving dawah. If the Muslim community doesn't give dawah, they're going to suffer from lowliness. Many ayat of the Quran and ahadith show and indicate that. Allah in Surah Al-Qasas said to Musa and to Harun, Bi ayatina antuma wa min ittaba'akuma al-ghalibun. By our ayat, ya Musa, by our ayat, by the ayat that Allah revealed, Torah, Injil, the Quran, by our ayat, you and your brother Musa, Harun, and those who follow you, 
you are going to be upper because of these ayat. Because of these ayat. And we gave this dars before actually. The importance of a da'wah to Allah and the danger of abandoning the da'wah. If the community abandons da'wah to Allah, it's going to be problems inside of the community and externally as well. In the authentic hadith in the mustad of Imam Ahmed, the Prophet says وسلم, that Allah commanded Zakaria, Yahya ibn Zakaria. Allah commanded him to tell Ben Israel about five things, to work by those five things and to take care of them. The hadith said that Yahya ibn Zakaria, he was slow in executing that command. He took his time. So Isa ibn Maryam said to Yahya ibn Zakaria, when he saw that he was slow to go tell Ben Israel, he said, look, if you don't tell them, I'll go and tell them. Yahya ibn Zakaria said to Isa ibn Maryam, Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhima, no, no, because if I don't do it, if I don't command them, if I don't do what Allah told me to do, then I'm afraid that Allah will cause the earth to open up and swallow me up, or Allah will punish me with a punishment that's severe. So he went and told them. So the Ramal of Al-Islam, the Ramal took from this hadith, along with those many ayat in Surah Al-Jinn and Al-Ahqaf and other that, they took from this hadith, showing Yahya ibn Zakariya said, if I don't do what Allah told me to do in educating Bani Israel, he'll open up the earth and swallow me up. Allah is going to punish me if I don't give a dawah in Allah. Because not to give dawah is a sign of lowliness is in itself. Why wouldn't you give dawah? You're afraid of people. You're afraid of people. People are shy and embarrassed to talk about other people about a tawheed, to talk about the deen of Allah. He doesn't tell the people he works with. He doesn't tell his family members. He's on the sunnah, they're not. He doesn't take the time out to engage them with the doubt of Allah. Why not? Many times, the reason for that is people are afraid. They're afraid. I'm going to stop here, Khwani, not do the last one, inshallah, as with you. We're going to have the opposite of this daros, inshallah, believe. I don't know. They always call me during the middle of the week, towards the end of the week, saying, do you want to do the thing? Are you available? So I say, sure, I'll do it. But I think they're going to have the opposite of this, inshallah, next week. I'm not sure. But we're going to stop right here. If you brothers have any questions, you can put your questions forward. Any comments as well, you can put your comments forward. Five minutes, ten minutes, inshallah. What time is the event? Ten o'clock. Halindakum shaykh. تفضل يا أخي نور الدين عبد القادر you okay where you been you got married oh Allah marry عبد القادر oh Allah marry عبد القادر to a good Muslim sister and a good family he's from the good brothers from our community قولوا آمين oh Allah open up the door for عبد القادر and open up the door for our brother عبد الحي as well Help these shabab to get married. Allahumma, we ask you this by your ism al-a'zam. Open up the way for these brothers. Tafadri akhi, Nur al-Din. Yeah, Ikhwani, this, um, I think we spoke about this recently, this statement, this feeling, this understanding that some people have when Muslims are suffering around the globe and a person who's on the sunnah, salafi, he, he has this understanding, well, they left tohi, so they get what they deserve. The Muslim with iman doesn't say stuff like that. Knowledge doesn't support that. And the religion in terms of the rahmah, none of you truly believes you love for your brother what you love for yourself. You don't want to see any harm happen to your brother. You don't know why Allah Azzawajal punished people with this or punish people with that. We're all guilty of what's going on in Palestine. There are Palestinians who are from the Odia of Allah. Know the religion better than us. They know the religion better than us. So why is Allah not punishing us? Because we don't know when Allah chooses to punish this one or that one. How could somebody possibly say that? I heard that years ago with the FIS 
we don't support the minhaj and understanding of the FIS of Algeria and many issues and the role that they played in the spread of the blood there. We ain't down with those generals neither. But the FIS, we wasn't in support of their minhaj, the understanding of Islam. But for someone to say the people of Algeria are getting what they deserve when people were really being killed, how can you say that? Here's a brother right here from Algeria. He's from Kashmir. He's from Palestine. This one is from Somalia. Somalia has been the, the problems of Somalia that are going on. People who come from there. When they hear someone else who's not there, it's my mother, my father, my relatives who are suffering, really suffering. I hear someone says, well, it's shit there. They're not really doing the sunnah, so they, they deserve what they get. Who says that? Somebody says that something's wrong with his head. He doesn't understand the religion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam used to be affected and used to be sad when his own people were afflicted with things. He didn't want nasty and bad things to happen to people. Prophets and the messengers, they care about people. So again, again, the punishment of Allah is from his wisdom. And that statement, that mokif, it reminds me of that man who the Prophet said about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man al-ladhi, man al-ladhi yata'ala Allah. Who is it that has the nerve and the audacity to rise up and to like put himself in the position to say, Allah did this and Allah did that because of this or that. When the man said, Wallahi, Allah will never forgive you and never put you into Jannah. That's what the man said. The Prophet said, who has the nerve to say, Allah won't put someone in the Jannah, Allah won't forgive someone? Who has the nerve to say, they're receiving this because they deserve it. Allah, this, Allah. What are you talking about? Maybe we're the ones. Why are we exempt right here? Why are we exempt with the things that we're doing? Why don't we get punished like that? You mean to tell me we don't, de we don't deserve that? We didn't do things to deserve Allah's punishment? And those people did? No one speaks like that except emotions. That's emotions. And it's not acceptable. Calm down and relax with that type of thing. We're going to stop here, inshallah. May Allah ta'ala bless you, brothers. And may he subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all a thabat al kitab sunnah according to the understanding of the salaf of this ummah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.